Good morning and welcome to worship. We're glad that you're joining us at this time. Today we celebrate Worldwide Communion Sunday. So I invite you to, to uh, pause for just a moment and go get what you need in terms of bread and juice, and then you'll be prepared when we get to that point of the service. Uh, our events this week include this afternoon at 2, we'll have a drive through communion service on our parking lot near the cemetery. It's also an opportunity to collect canned foods for Yoke Fellow. So uh, we'll be out there between 2 and 3, and if we need to be there a little longer, we'll, we'll remain for those who come to receive drive through communion. Today also we have uh, our Zoom Sunday School. It's every Sunday at 1115. If you would like a link to that gathering, let us know at the church office at office at graceravenchurch.org. We'd be happy to send you a link for that uh, gathering. We have Christian Education by Zoom tomorrow night at 6. Our community meal delivery will be this week at 430. And then our in-person worship service on Wednesday night at 7 in the fellowship hall. We had a great crowd this past week. We invite anyone who would like to be a part to come and be with us. Uh, but please RSVP through the church office before Wednesday lunch so we'll know who's coming and make sure we have enough space for everybody. And then finally, our grief support group will meet this week at 6. That's also a Zoom link. If you're interested, uh, please contact us. We'll give you a link for that gathering on Thursday, 6 p.m. If you need assistance, if you need someone to uh, run an errand for you or pick up a prescription for you, let us know. We'd love to help. We've got volunteers ready, willing, and able to support you in anything that you need in that regard. We do thank you for your support, and it has been very generous and, and uh, strong, and we hope that that will continue through the fall. If you're tuning in for the first time and you're wondering how to send a contribution to us, you can use the regular mail and, and the address 1401 North Main Street in Mount Airy, 27030. Or you can text as one word, Grace Moravian, from any digital device uh, to 77977 in the dollar amount, and that contribution will go to support our ministries. We're so grateful um, that folks have done that. Others who just want to drop a donation by, we encourage you to use our drop box, which is located on the fellowship hall door. It is a secure drop box, and uh, we welcome you to do that. That cuts down on the potential for COVID exposure for everybody. So today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's an opportunity when Christian traditions across the world choose to do communion together on the same day as an expression of our unity in Christ. Before this service begins, again, I encourage you to get bread and juice of, uh, in whatever form you choose and be prepared for that moment. Uh, let's begin our worship today by standing to sing hymn number 522, Glorious Things of You Are Spoken. Let's stand together.
have as a reader today, uh, David Pruitt, and we read together portions of the Liturgy for Christian Unity. Almighty God, you are the one who called this universe into being. Out of nothing you created everything that is. By your power, you hold together all space and time and substance. By your hand alone, Creator God, the inanimate elements became alive so that we would live and move and have our being. We celebrate life, the precious life you have given us, and we celebrate that unity of mind and emotions, of body and soul, that you want us to enjoy and share with each other. We rejoice in the certainty, the centrality of Jesus Christ in all your works, for he was with you from the very beginning and is supreme over all creation. We praise you that Christ is before all things and that in him all things hold together, especially our very fragile, vulnerable, and often broken lives. We know that we will remain less than the whole persons you have called us to be in Christ Jesus until we acknowledge our sins to you. And so we bow before you and pray. Almighty God, we confess that we have tried to run away and hide from you. We constantly derive ourselves into thinking that we can live without you. We have made idols of our own achievements. We have treated other persons as though they did not bear your image. We have failed to enfold and include all persons within the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ our Savior. And we have left undone those deeds of loving kindness and godly justice that you want us to pursue in your name. Bring your Spirit upon us in a gracious, healing way. Make us agents of reconciliation as we live within your holy presence. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that becomes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ in the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His sufferings, by becoming like Him in His death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Our next reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. God always blesses the reading and the hearing of his. This morning, I uh, again remind you that today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's kind of nice thinking about Christian traditions around the world observing communion on this day as a sign of our unity. So in some ways, this, this Sunday represents a celebration that we're not the only Christians in the world. Moravians have never assumed that, and that we're part of a bigger family. But it also stands as a moment of confession and repentance for not living up to a stronger witness before the world. When we think about the way that we should live, the way that was uh, exemplified and embodied in Christ, there's a lot to think about. And yet, in, today, it's important in, in regards to confession and repentance to know that for the most part in our American culture, often Christians are not seen the way we might think. In fact, a large portion of the population assume that people who go to church aren't actually Christian. They're just people that are cherry-picking certain Christian values while leaving the other more difficult values out of their life. I think about years ago, listening to the difference between belief and values, belief, those things we aspire to be, and I think all the things that are represented in Christian faith we would want to aspire to be. But values... Those are the things we actually do. And the witness of the Christian church in our country needs to be different. It needs to be more about reconciliation and grace and unity and less about a partisan spirit. One way to reflect on the tension that we find in both these passages today from Paul's words about living the faith and Jesus' story here about the tension he had when he told that parable to the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders is the word simplicity. It just has this way of bringing together what we should be in terms of followers of Jesus. So I want to ask you this morning to think about what simplicity means to you, to give some thought of what Jesus is saying in this text as well as Paul is saying to the Philippians, and even more importantly, what, we, what should we do about simplicity in our living. When I think about simplicity, I don't find that, uh, and I've, I got to teach for a while in a college setting, uh, intro New Testament things, and I found without exception, people generally understand Jesus as a person who embodied simplicity. He was not one given to worry about achievements or the things that he owned or possessions or rank or status. It was so much more simple than that. And yet almost everybody I've encountered, and I would admit this about myself, know that simplicity is very hard. It's very hard maybe because um, as somebody uh, that went to the university I did and he became famous for what he wrote about pastoral theology, his name was John Claypool, he put it just in a simple terms. Think of your life in segments of 20 years. So that first 20 years, we're trying to figure out who we are, who, who our parents are, our identity, our connection to the world. In that second 20 years, we begin to uh, fill that identity with important relationships, perhaps marriage or career, children, other important things that, that we value. In that third set of 20 years, things change radically. And this is where maybe the gospel makes a little more sense to us. Because now that we have the things we think we need, we begin to give back. And this is where a lot of things happen in this community of Mount Airy because there's a lot of loving people who enable great ministry to occur, not just from churches, but from all kind of charitable institutions like Yoke Fellow. But then there's that last set of 20 years. And John Claypool, I think, was wise when he said, sometimes we look back and realize that we wasted 
those middle two sets because we got too hung up in who we are, too hung up in relationships and possessions, and not hung up enough in giving back. And it can make for a bitter last 20 years of your life. Simplicity is interesting in the Moravian tradition because we tend to describe it with that simple motto, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, freedom or liberty. In all things, love or charity. They use that motto as a way to describe more importantly how when we're starting to live the Christian life and we really do care about giving our hands, our minds, our hearts to God in a daily way, that motto sort of gives it perspective. You know, there's things I can get all caught up in I think are essential that really are not. And there's people that I love and care about that may think of things in a different way than me. And if it's not essential, don't sweat it. But there are things that are clearly essential that I need to give attention to. But no matter what I give attention to, am I giving love to myself and to the people in my connections? I think this is where Paul comes in in our text this morning And it's a beautiful text. He uses the metaphor of running a race like a marathon race. And he reminds us in that metaphor to be the follower of Christ, to take this life seriously, to get the best of grace in our lives. We've got to be simple, like a marathon runner. And marathon runners don't do well when they're carrying a bunch of stuff, when they're worried too much about anything other than the prize. And I love that line about the upper prize, the call of Christ. But I want to warn you that this passage also carries a very strong warning about grace. Because I think as a Christian community sometimes, and I'm not just talking about Moravians, I'm talking about all of us, we come off looking like we're trying to work hard to get God's grace, to earn God's grace. And that is not what Paul's talking about. In fact, Paul's describing a life that's becoming more and more available to him, full and filled with God's presence, that he wants to get rid of everything that he possibly can to make more room for God, to run a simple life. And he says, not that he's made it his own, but that Christ has made him his own. I hope you're you're discovering that in your life. I think it takes your whole life to figure that out. And I'm glad that we have a church community that helps us do that. And then we get to that passage that Jesus is teaching from this morning in Matthew 21. And let's be honest, it's a hard one. It's a scary parable. We were at a retreat this week, the clergy of the southern province and some of our educators, and it was different this year because we did it both in person and virtual. I attended virtually, which helped me a lot. And not only did southern province pastors attend virtually, but there were pastors all over the northern province. So it was a much more attended event than usual. And there were quite a few that were at Law Ridge in person. Our speaker was Dr. David Hooker, who is the director of the uh, Croc Center for Peace and Justice at the University of Notre Dame. He had a lot of wonderful things to talk about, giving uh, stuff that we're living through as a culture right now, particularly through the summer. He spoke to us last year, and it seemed like this year it came alive. I think it's the only guy I know in 31 years that was invited to speak two years in a row. But there was this real critical moment for me in the retreat when a young pastor, a young Latina Moravian pastor that that serves in our area asked him a really important question about speaking the truth as a pastor but not wanting to be political to upset your congregation. And he began to, to show us this vision of Jesus that we sometimes forget. How Jesus was relentlessly compassionate, relentlessly forgiving, relentlessly loving to everyone, literally from Pilate to the most simple person that he healed. But Jesus was unrelenting, unforgiving to the system that it created so much heartbreak and and so much division between the have-nots and the haves and so forth. And it's sometimes hard to separate those two things. In our culture, we think to be a part of the system, everything has to fit. And Jesus is saying something really different. Well, by this point, when he, when he said what he said, we are all got a big knot in our brain trying to figure it out. And he's still in a one-on-one con- uh, conversation with my colleague, and he asked this powerful question, and I ask it of you this morning. Does or did your parents love you? 
And she said, of course. How about your grandparents? Did they, do, did they love you or do they love you? Of course they do. He says, I hate to tell you this, but they lied. We all lie. And there were certain prejudices and certain insights that your grandparents had because of the culture they were raised in. That's a lie. But it doesn't change the fact that they love you. And they passed some of that to your parents, and maybe your parents uh, co-opted some other things, and not all the things that your parents have said to you are truthful. There's a bunch of it that's a lie, but they still love you. And then he put it all together in a challenge the way Jesus would. Can you hold the love and not hold on to the lie and still be in relationship? Jesus never broke relationship with anybody. He loved everybody relentlessly, but he never bought into the system. So I think when we take that idea of simplicity to that kind of level of Christian culture, it gives us something different to look at when we're listening uh, to this passage from Jesus. This past summer, I had a chance to, to be a part of a class and a discussion of the book, The Color of Compromise. It's a great one I highly recommend, written by Jamar Tisby and published by Zondervan Publishing House, a, a great Christian publishing house. And in it, he explores how racism particularly has got infested in the, in the Christian church in America. But he starts out with this really important image that fits this passage in what Paul's saying and, and the whole idea of being Christian. He says, for in the arc of history as well as Scripture, we hear there can be no reconciliation without repentance. There can be no repentance without confession. And there can be no confession without the truth. It's not enough for us when we know we've broken community with others to say, I'm sorry. There has to be true reconciliation, repentance, and confession. So I told you that we would get to the part about what do we do about simplicity. You know, simplicity brings us to the awareness that we are not God and He is. And no matter how broken or imperfect or screwed up we might think we are, guess what? You're invited to this table. In fact, this table is the most important object lesson that we have. Because when you look at a communion table, no matter how it is set up, there's something very obvious that's different than a normal dinner table, and it's that there's not a head of the table. And that's by design. Because there's not a, a position of privilege. There, it, we're all welcomed here. We're all here because we are the children of God, and we're invited, not because of what we've done or gained or work to do, but because of who God is. When we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we have an opportunity to become exactly what we eat, the body of Christ for the world. Simplicity is a call for us to recognize what's in the way of that and to own what we need to do to change it so we do reflect the one we serve. This morning as we prepare for this table, I invite you to sing with me the, the following hymn, as a way of preparation. Whenever we do virtual uh, communion, uh, the actual communion service part's pretty simple, but it's followed by a time of listening. And we, we've got beautiful music for you to listen and consider today. And then we're going to conclude worship with a very important inter time of intercessory prayer. Remember, simplicity. Not your simplicity, His simplicity. He invites you because of who He is and not who you are. And you are welcome at the table. Let's sing together our next hymn.
Hope you've had a chance to get whatever elements you want to use for communion. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we pray that you would come and inhabit this bread, not only the bread that's in the sanctuary, but in every home, that we might be reminded in the bread of what you've done for us, that you might enter the cup, the juice, in whatever form it takes, both here and at home, that it would become more than just a symbol, but truly your blood for us, for it's in this bread and in this cup that we find ourselves and we find our redemption in you. And now, Lord, we pray together the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, This is the cup of a new covenant. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He come. I invite you to a time of quiet reflection as we listen to the music.
By grace our, our confession is heard. By grace our repentance is true. By grace reconciliation happens and takes us back out into the world to serve. And one expression of that as a community is to pray for each other. So David and I return to the Liturgy for Christian Unity on page 124 using portions of this as well as a portion of the Liturgy for Intercession in a Time of Crisis. Let's pray together. We thank You, gracious God, for establishing the church as a single body of interdependent members, each having a place and purpose. And are called to appreciate the great variety of gifts You have given us to use. Help us to rejoice with those who feel joy and delight. Help us to sing with those who were singing Your love and praise. Help us to taste the agony of those who are hurting. Help us to share the burden of those who are in distress. Take away jealousy and resentment from our hearts when we see others achieving success. Fill us with that spirit of unity in Christ that lets us see and feel and know that we all belong to You through the grace we have received. Teach us to know and love the worldwide church called out of all peoples and nations. Make visible the unity that You desire as we express a spirit of reconciliation in all our relationships. Show us that we're part of the one and only body of Christ, unified by faith, scattered for witness and service. Lead us to appreciate the richness of our diversity and Your creative power at work in our various traditions and customs. Make us all one with You by the inspiration and guidance of Your Spirit. Lead us into lives worthy of Your calling in Christ, with all lowliness, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We do pause in this moment to remember those for whom we've been praying. We continue to pray for all those on our prayer list, those who are grieving, those who are healing from recent, uh, recent medical procedures, those who are lonely, and those who are struggling with un un unemployment or underemployment. Lord, be with all of our people that we have been lifting to You in prayer. We pray especially for our President in this time of crisis as he has covid and other leaders in Washington may as well. And we pray these words from the liturgy of intercession in the time of crisis. We pray for those engaged in making important decisions in this time, for those who report on these events and for those who shape public opinion. Give them the courage to speak out and the restraint to listen that together we may discern the truth and hold aloft its light. Take away the temptation to trust in human power and give us the courage to be your servants to the community of nations. Direct all governments in the way of peace and justice that your will may be known and done among the nations as you seek to bring healing to our leaders and to the entire country that continues to be ravaged by COVID. I return to the liturgy of Christian unity. Dear God, as we, your people, gather in every time and place around this wondrous earth, let us be strengthened by our awareness of one another and united by our mutual prayers. Hear us and help us all, we pray. May the variety of traditions and customs of your whole church become a multitude of lights to reveal the good news needed by people everywhere. May the variety of our ministries and service convey your redemptive love and bind us ever closer to one another. Grant us grace to unite in essentials, to accept diversity in non-essentials, and to love one another in all things. We close this time of worship by standing to sing together hymn number 511, The Church's One Foundation. Let's stand as we sing together.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Thank you.